first. Okay, yep. Okay, now we're recording. So the next uh, speaker of the session is Dominic Berry from the University of Macquarie. So he's going to be telling us about how we can use quantum computers to solve problems in, in chemistry using these new techniques called uh, tensor hypercontraction. Okay, go ahead, Dominic. So uh, I'd like to start oh. off by thinking. Yep. Should I, I should also remind everyone actually to put their questions into Slack. I think you need to do that at the beginning of every talk. So if you have a question, enter it in the Slack channel. Okay, sorry, carry on, Dominic. Okay, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers and also my co authors on this, uh, particularly people at Google and Ryan Babush, who's a group leader there. Also, there's Junho Lee, who's the, uh, doing the numerics for the tensor hypercontraction, and Nathan Weem, who was at Washington and has recently moved to Toronto. So the general motivation for quantum algorithms for quantum chemistry is that if you can simulate chemicals, then you can simulate <coughs> a whole lot of different chemicals to screen them for ones that have particular properties that you're interested in. So for example, the uh, pharmaceuticals or batteries or fertilizer. And fertilizer is a particular case of interest because it's a, the, the a um, method for fixing nitrogen industrially is inefficient and the biological process is more efficient, but it's based on a large chemical called FOMOCO, which is difficult to simulate. So when you're looking at classical simulations, they tend to become they are more and more difficult quite rapidly as you go into larger systems. And once you get to something the size of FOMOCO, it tends to either be intractable or you need to use approximate methods where it's not clear what the actual accuracy of the, the uh, result is. So this is a good test case to work out the complexity of our, our algorithms. And we, we lay out the algorithm in the surface code to estimate the total number of physical qubits that had been needed as well as the total runtime. So our new method provides the best result for FOMOCO as well as the best a complexity scaling. So the complexity scaling here is in terms of n, which is a very important parameter. This is the number of orbitals. So orbitals are essentially how we represent the system in quantum chemistry. And an orbital is basically a spatial pattern for an electron. And when you have many electrons, the state is corresponding to each orbital either being occupied by an electron or not occupied. So there's two distinct cases here. The first column is what's called a thermodynamic limit where you're considering the case as the system is growing. So for the numerics, we considered a hydrogen chain of hydrogen atoms. The other case is what's called the continuum limit where you're just considering the, the case of a single system and you're increasing n to get higher precision. And there's also a parameter epsilon here that's corresponding to the accuracy in the other things and ignoring any accuracy to do with choosing a finite value of n. Now, the top one here is from our work in 2016 using Taylor series and using our new numerics, we estimate that the scaling of that is about n to the 5.3, whereas the new work using tensor hypercontraction is about n squared, which is a vast improvement and it's the best out of all of these prior works. There was also some very nice work by the Microsoft group last year where they used double factorization and we estimate that the scaling of that would go like into 3.4. So we get more than a factor of n improvement over that. If you look at the continuum limit, we still seem to have the best scaling, though not by quite such a large margin. Now, the complexity is being quantified here in terms of a number of non Clifford gates, and we're ignoring Clifford gate complexities. And the reason is that if you're doing things in the surface code, it's much, much easier to do Clifford gates, but non Clifford gates, which is things like T's and Toffoli's you need to distill special magic states with schemes like as shown at the bottom here. And they, uh, these tend to be so much more costly that we they, uh, just count those. And they, uh, for the Toffoli gates, it turns out you can distill magic states for them directly. And that's the example shown there. 
and also our algorithms tend to only need the, the uh, Toffoli gates. So we only count the Toffoli gates in these algorithms. And I should mention that the Toffolis are controlled uh, C knots or controlled controlled knots. So the general procedure that we're using for these types of algorithms is to write the Hamiltonian in a linear combination of unit trees where the HLs are unit tree. And we're then constructing a step, step of a quantum walk like this. And there's a very important parameter, which is what we're calling lambda, which is the sum of the weightings of WL in terms of absolute values. And the overall complexity of the algorithm tends to scale linearly in lambda. So we generally want to have representations of the Hamiltonian with small values of lambda. Now to apply this W operation, this first top line here is an ancilla, and this P is a state preparation which prepares a superposition state where the amplitudes go like the square roots of the weights in the Hamiltonian. Then you do a controlled HL, and HL is taken to be unitary, invert the preparation and then reflect about zero. And that gives you an overall operation which is a function of the Hamiltonian in the sense that the eigenvalues are functions of the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So generally you're wanting a ground state energy for the Hamiltonian and you can determine that just by doing phase estimation on this operation W rather than trying to say the, um, the simulate time evolution under the Hamiltonian, which is what prior work did. Now the type of Hamiltonians that we have are the ones that look like this. So there's two sums here. Uh, the first sum is a fourfold sum and tends to be the largest term. And the end, remember that's the number of orbitals that we're representing the state of the system on. And since it's a fourfold sum, you tend to get into the fourth terms here. And as well as the complexity scaling linearly in lambda, it tends to scale like the square root of the amount of data that's stored in the Hamiltonian. So if you have a very large amount of data in the Hamiltonian, then this tends to give you a large complexity. So one approach that we used to try and reduce the amount of data was just to ignore small e terms in this sum. So values of VPQRS, which were close to zero, were just thrown out and we just included the larger ones. And we found that that gave a good result for FOMOCO, but we didn't have any good theory for how it should scale for larger systems. A alternative where there is a good theory for that is the single factorization, which we did in the same paper, and you're essentially factorizing the Hamiltonian like this. So you'd have a sum over L and this square of another sum here. So this L is a rank, essentially coming from a matrix decomposition, and it's found that you can take L to be truncated at about order N. And since you have this GLPQ here, which is the parameters which are describing the Hamiltonian, if that has L ranging over N things, then there's order N cubed parameters instead of N to the fourth. So that's a, bit, a good improvement. An alternative approach, which we mentioned there but didn't analyze, is a double factorization. And that was what the Microsoft group with von Berg, they analyzed. So the idea there is this sum inside the brackets is they changed, they, you do a change of the basis of orbitals, they according to UL, and then you just, they basically diagonalize it. So you just have a sum over number operators here, rather than having an A dagger P and an AQ. And you can also take this AL and put it inside that sum. So you have different the U operators for each value of M. And that has a nice feature that if you are doing it that way, the number of elementary rotations that U is implemented in only needs to be N rather than N squared, which is what it would need to be if you were doing all of the orbitals at once. Now, our approach is using tensor hypercontraction, which is an established method in quantum chemistry. And there's an example of a reference down the bottom. And you're generally expressing this VPQRS in terms of chi and zeta matrices. So these now are 
the uh, two-dimensional matrices rather than three-dimensional. So the number of parameters is going like the ends order n squared. And an important feature here is that there's an m here rather than an n. So this m is generally larger than n, but it's still of order n, which is why the number of parameters is going like order n squared. And that's an even better improvement over the order n cubed or order n to the fourth parameters that there were before. Now, a problem with doing things this way is that you end up having a number of steps that's scaling like lambda, which is now a six-fold sum over the absolute values of these products. And this ends up being much larger and making the overall, the algorithm much more complicated. So what you can do, do to get around that is to group together the sums like this. So these sums, if you choose the appropriate weighting between the chi and the zetas, so the chi's are normalized, these things you can basically call new annihilation or creation operators C. But now there's actually M of these C operators. And these are now a corresponding to non-orthogonal E orbitals. And this is a major problem having a non-orthogonal orbitals. And it looks like a very difficult task at first to try and convert between these orthogonal orbitals and non-orthogonal orbitals. And the initial methods that we looked at need a very large complexity. But then I had an insight, which was that it, essentially you're doing things in a linear combination here. So you have that control register that I mentioned before, and that control register has a superposition over values of mu and mu. And then when you're doing things in the controlled operations, you're controlling on a value of mu or nu to do your unit trees. So it's essentially looking like this, where you're doing these parts in a superposition. And you're only needing to do a rotation of the orbital basis corresponding to one of these Cs at a time. So what that means is that it doesn't matter that the other orbitals are not orthogonal. You can basically do it as if there was a set of other orthogonal orbitals in each part of the superposition and do different unitary rotations. And this means that you can essentially have no more complexity in doing this unitary rotation than you have for the case of the double factorization. And we can apply many of the methods that they used. And of course, the reason why we were doing this in the first place is to reduce that value of lambda and the new value of lambda is just going like the twofold sum over these zetas. And there tends to be a lot of cancellation in there that makes the value of lambda much smaller now. And in fact, it turns out that the value of lambda that we get is quite close to the value for the double factorization in the case of FOMOCO. And things look even better when we look at the scaling for the larger systems. So if you look at the thermodynamic limit, which remember was the growing system size. That's the graph shown on the left here. And you'll see there that the line at the bottom there, that's for the tensor hypercontraction method. And that's the fitting to that line gives n to the 1.11, whereas the next line up, which is a double factorization, has a scaling going like n to the 1.88. There's also a better scaling in the continuum limit, which is shown on the right, but it's not such a large improvement. And you see there that actually for the size that's being simulated there, the double factorization actually has a smaller value of lambda. Now, in order to do the actual controlled unit trees, we can't use the number operators. We have to translate things into unit trees. Now, the representation on the quantum computer is to use a single qubit for each of the orbitals and have it zero if there's no the electron in that orbital or one if there is. And then the, the fermionic annihilation and creation operators can be recombined into, into Majorana operators. And those can be represented using a jordan Wigner transformation. And then the number operator is just identity minus Z over two. So then the two body term in the Hamiltonian is, just has the Ns replaced with Zs. And it also has a factor of one eighth at the front instead of one half. 
So that gives us an improvement in the value of lander. And also the, we do need to take account of these identities in there as well. And they go into the one body term. Then the overall controlled unit tree ends up looking something like this. So applying an approach from the, the Von Berg paper, the rotations are done by a QROM approach that's shown here where you have an input, which would be the mu or the nu, which is being used to output data for the angles of the rotations for the rotation of the orbitals. Then based on that, you do a con these controlled, the Gibbons rotations, then you do the Z operation, invert the Gibbons rotations, and then erase the data. And you do that once for mu and once for nu, and we've actually swapped mu and nu there rather than doing it separately between mu and nu. Now, in order to do the, the, um, the quantum ROM, the, we use a scheme that looks like this. So to explain the idea of the quantum ROM, essentially what you have is a input register, which would have a value, which is a called L here. And you want, you're choosing classically some data DL and you're wanting to output in a quantum register the value of DL based on the value of L in the first register. Now, this is being indicated in a circuit on the right where you have C knots, which are either there or not. The, and that's what the question mark's indicating depending on whether you're outputting a zero or a one. And a, another thing which is confusing at first here is these left and right elbows. And what these correspond to is introducing an ancilla, which is zero, doing a toffoli, or doing a toffoli and then having a zero ancilla, which can then be thrown away. And it turns out that these right elbows, they can just be done with measurements and cliffords. They don't give you any actual toffoli cost. And when you look at the overall scheme, it ends up having a toffoli cost, which is less than the number of items of data that you actually need to output. Now you can show that by decomposing multiply controlled toffolies and into toffolies and cancelling toffolies in between. Uh, but I don't have time to go into that. But another important thing to describe is how the state preparation is done. And I should mention that this is from our work in 2018, and similarly for the QROM. And remember, we're aiming to prepare a superposition state, which has amplitudes going like the square roots of the weightings WL in the linear combination of unit trees. Now, it turns out that for the purpose of this, it's allowable to have these the registers entangled with other registers that essentially have garbage information. And this enables us to use a special technique we call coherent alias sampling, which is like a coherent analog of the alias sampling technique for generating probability distributions. And the general idea is that you use the QROM to output an alternate value of L and a keep value. And you swap L and the alt L according to that keep probability. So the, uh, that gives you a very efficient way of preparing states, except you do need to use that QROM on with many, many items of data. And it turns out that it's actually possible to do more this more efficiently. And there's a scheme that was shown in 2018 which is the, it looks like this, and it's essentially dividing your control register into high qubits and low qubits. So the top two here are the high qubits, and for each value on those, you're outputting every item of data for every possible value of the low qubits. Then that's the left half of this circuit diagram, then the right half is doing controlled swaps, controlled on those low qubits, which is swapping the d data you want into this output register, which is shown as the AX here. And the overall complexity ends up going like the square root of the number of items of data multiplied by the number of bits for each of these items. So that's essentially the square root of the total number of bits of data. And it's this type of the, the QROM which it gives us a overall complexity, which is scaling like the square root of the data in the Hamiltonian. And I should mention as well that the, this needs a large number of ancillas and you can adjust the number of ancillas and toffolies by choosing the division between the high and low qubits on that control register.
So as well, what we want to do is limit the number of bits that are used for the output data and to work out what you can restrict it to, you need some estimate of the error due to using a finite number of bits. And you also want to estimate the error due to using a finite value of M. So remember M, that was the truncation for the tensor hypercontraction method. There was a sum up to M there. So what you can do is work out the exact Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian with these approximations and do a classical calculation of the difference between the ground states. And it turns out that this the, um, the gives results shown like this here for the case where you're just looking at error due to finite M and the red line is showing zero error and the, the black dashed lines are showing the chemical accuracy. So if these lines are within the black dashed lines then it's showing that M is large enough. Now there's two distinct lines here and what these are for are two different types of orbitals. So there's one which is from a paper by the Riot group the, uh, back in 2017 and that takes the number of orbitals to be 108 and there was some concern that these were the, um, they had some problems and so Lee the et al was proposing an alternative set of orbitals where n is 152 but it's expected to be more accurate and we're giving results for both for comparison to the Raya work or the, well, the work of the Microsoft group where they're doing things in terms of those Raya orbitals. Now, for these results, what we did was allowed a total error of 1.6 milli Hartree with one milli Hartree for phase estimation, 0.6 milli Hartree for the approximation of the Hamiltonian. And for the Raya orbitals, we found that we could do it in about 5 billion Toffolis. Then for the Li orbitals, it's about six times as large at 32 billion Toffolis, which is a little bit disappointing, but it seems to be an intrinsic problem because it has a larger value of lambda. And also if you compute the value of lambda for the Li orbitals using the double factorization, it also turns out to be larger there as well. So this seems to be a intrinsic difference between the two sets of orbitals. We also recomputed the complexities for the double factorization approach and a few earlier approaches using these numbers of the a numbers of bits and allowable the accuracy for the phase estimation. And we found that the von Berg approach had slightly lower complexity than they quoted in the paper, but still about twice the complexity that we have with the tensor hypercontraction. And that's in both the case of the Raya orbitals and the Lee orbitals. And a surprise there was that when we recomputed the complexity for the sparse approach, our number of Toffolis for the Lee orbitals was actually lower than for the double factorization approach. Now, if you want to look at the scaling for larger systems, so remember that previous slide that was for the complexity for FOMOCO. Now, remember the complexity is going like the lambda value, which is sum of weights for the Hamiltonian multiplied by the square root of the data. Now for the tensor hypercontraction method, we have this scaling going like n squared, and there's an O tilde there that's just indicating that we're throwing away the uh, logarithmic terms when we're quoting these complexities. But for the double factorization, it turns out that the number of the, um, the amount of data you need is tending to scale like n cubed. So that's an upper bound and it might be hoped that it would be less than that, but for these uh, calculations, it was turning out to scale like that. Now, if you take the square roots of those amounts of data and multiply it by the scalings for lambda that we gave before, we get a scaling of n, a, about n squared for the tensor hypercontraction versus about n to 3.4 for the double factorization. So the, um, we have a good improvement there and a, a slight, the, um, slight, the, um, moderate improvement for the continuum limit. It's about by a factor of n to 0.7. Now this approach is how we gave the values in this table, which I won't go over again. But what I will talk about is how to the, reduce the number of ancillas. So this is the number of qubits uh, over time 
uh, corresponding to numbers of Toffolis for the different stages of our algorithm when we're just minimizing things for the number of Toffolis but disregarding the number of e, um, ancillas that are needed. And you can see here that in the beginning where we're doing the QROM, we're needing a very large number of ancillas. But then we can tweak things and they, they reduce the amount of ancillas needed for that QROM by a large amount just by adjusting how we divide between the high and low uh, qubits in that the advanced QROM. And for this, we also output the angles for the rotations in two parts instead of just outputting them all at once. And when we do that, we only need less than 700 logical qubits. And when we translate that to physical qubits in the surface code with a 0.1% error rate, you can use less than 4 million physical qubits and have a runtime less than four days. So just to conclude here, we have the highest efficiency yet where the two features that are making the efficiency higher are having a small lambda norm and also having a small amount of data in the representation of the Hamiltonian. And our projected scaling for larger systems of about n squared is the best scaling yet, and as well as the best scaling for this challenge case of FOMOCO, the complexity of 5 billion Toffolis is also the best result yet. So it shows that this is practical because it's giving smaller, smaller complexities for the, the practical example. And I'll just finish by mentioning the archive paper at the bottom there. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk, Dominic. So I think we've only got time for one question now. So I'll kind of paraphrase a combination of different questions from the Slack channel, which are around the theme of how does um, N scale and how do the number of electrons scale? So I suspect maybe this is different in the two cases, right? So you're talking about Tomoko towards the end, but the beginning of the results for the, the, the chains, right, the hydrogen chains. Remember off the top of my head how many electrons there are. Um, the, I think the number of electrons is maybe about half of the number of orbitals for these. So this is a set of orbitals that's chosen to be very efficient. So the number of orbitals is low. You can also consider the methods of simulation where you have a very large number of orbitals um, they, using plane waves. And in that case, the number of electrons would be much le less than the number of orbitals. But for th these ones, mm -hmm. you don't really get any improvement if you have a scaling of the complexity in terms of the electrons rather than the orbitals. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, you also had this table that had the thermodynamic limit and the continuum limit. So presumably one of those limits, something is held constant and then something else, the other is held constant. So can you- Oh yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. the thermodynamic limit is just growing the size of the system. So that's the case that you'd be most interested in if you're simulating more and more complicated molecules. The continuum limit, you just have the one system and increase the number of orbitals to make that more and more accurately represented. So in the continuum limit, the, the number of electrons would stay constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the continuum limit, you'd have the same number of electrons, but larger and larger in. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, so we're up for time. So thank you for a brilliant talk, Dominic. Yeah, thank you. And, um,